going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 this week, and uh, the um, occasion for that is <laughs> the fact that uh, I'm going to teach this tomorrow out at the pastor's conference, and <laughs> so uh, I want you to kind of grade me and kind of go over things if I uh, misspell something in the handouts or uh, in the PowerPoint or... Actually, I've been studying for this for a couple of a couple of weeks. I've been reading it over for uh, over and over again for about a uh, you know three weeks or a month or so, and uh, and jumped way ahead thinking I could kind of nail this thing down pretty quick two weeks ago, and uh, really wasn't able to. And then and then so I kind of labored over it. And at some point in time, <laughs> decided that uh, um, might be a really good idea to make this the Sunday message instead of doing two two in a week. But also, as we got into last week's message in terms of uh, the the personal responsibility of uh, of dealing with sin, and I and both of these things in a sense dovetail together because uh, this one uh, really is about again some of the things we we sang about this morning. The the Lord's transforming work in, in our lives. Certainly, dealing with sin is is part of that, but it's also a uh, a work of the Holy Spirit. So uh, I, th I thought that it would uh, work well for us to go through this, uh, this passage this morning. Well, let's pray and, and then we'll jump in here. Father, we do want to commit our time here in 2 Corinthians 3. Wonderful chapter, uh, powerful verse in verse 18. One that, uh, that we could uh, build our lives around uh, your transformation of us and Lord, we pray that we would, we would learn, we would grow. We would not be like the person that James speaks about that looks in your word like a mirror and then walks away forgetting what he even looks like. Uh, we pray that we'd be not just hearers of your word, but we'd be doers and make application and, and see you work uh, and transform us to the image of Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. For, uh, for uh, I've mentioned it before, but for a number of years, I coached uh, youth sports, uh, seven, seven years of high school volleyball and four years of baseball, and, and uh, would uh, initially, anyway, attended pretty much every seminar that I could get to. It's one thing to play, it's another thing to coach, and it's another thing to coach kids. And uh, one of the th reoccurring themes uh, in terms of anybody that's involved in, in, uh, in youth sports, and the value is that if you can keep kids playing sports, they will do better academically. They will do better morally. They will be better employees. They will be better citizens. They'll be better off in about every category that we would value if you can keep them playing. But the huge dropout rate is typically right around, uh, right around 12, 13. Uh, and by 14, they're either going to keep playing you know, on into uh, – the early, you know, early 20s or whatever, or, or they're done already. And, uh, and the reason that they, they stop playing uh, is due to the fact that they do not see themselves making any progress. Uh, so the idea is in baseball to coach the fundamentals, you know, hitting, throwing, catching. If they can see themselves getting better and getting better and improving, they'll keep playing, and then they'll, they'll be better off for it. Uh, and that, that's, that's the same in, in any realm of sports. If they're not getting any better and it just becomes more frustrating, there's just a point to go, I'm out of here. Because <laughs> it's pretty demanding uh, in terms of time and, uh, and so forth. And I think the same could be said in terms of, of our Christian experience in, in terms of serving the Lord, 
but certainly uh, in terms of just our, our general walk with the Lord. Now, look down, in, in, uh, if you're at 2 Corinthians 3, look at chapter 4, verse 1. There's a therefore, so Paul's referring back to what we're going to study this morning. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. So Paul says, I've just told you what to do to keep from losing heart so that you'll persevere, so that you don't become discouraged. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And what it is, it is summarized, everything builds up to verse 18, where he says, we with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being trans transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Now, that's the NIV, and it misleads you. I want to tell you that right off the bat. As I studied this and dissected that verse, <laughs> it doesn't mean what I thought it meant for a number of years. One of my favorite verses. How's that? <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I, uh, hopefully this has been a blessing to me. I hope it'll be a blessing to you. But as I outlined it, I, I could just jump in right at that verse or five verses before it. But I think there's some things he has to say early on. The first 17 verses that all lead up to the punchline or that summary statement. So I'm going to move real quick through uh, the early verses. And then when we, uh, we get to the latter verses of the chapter, we'll, we'll slow down our, our pace a bit. But verse 1 to 3, there's the presence of the Holy Spirit should be seen by others in, in our lives. I think that's we, we all want that to happen. It says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of uh, commendation to you or letters of commendation from you you are our epistle written in our hearts known and read by all men clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us written not with ink but by the spirit of the living God not on tablets of stone but on tablets of flesh that is of the heart living epistles known and read by all men when I was a young Christian I thought that was a t-shirt <laughs> there was actually, a, you know, we have not of this world and truth armor, soul armor, all these groups. But about the, about the only uh, Christian t-shirt company around when I got saved was called Living Epistles. And uh, they had Bible verses on them and stuff. And, and uh, it, was, it was pretty hard to come by a Christian t-shirt in the day. So they were pretty successful. And uh, I know I, I would, uh, anytime we went to Disneyland with the kids, I'd always wear one with a Bible verse, the whole thing on my back because... You know, when that guy had to stand behind me to ride the log ride for an hour and 15 minutes, he's going he's gonna to get the word over. I'm going to be a living epistle, known and read, at least by that guy, for at least an hour right here at Disneyland, you know. And, and that's what I thought it was. But, uh, and it, but it's in reference to this. You know, Paul here is having to say, uh, again, does he really need to commend himself? Does he need to present a, a resume to these guys? And he's saying No. Uh, you guys are my resume. You know, we've come and we've ministered. It's been a work of the Holy Spirit, though. It's been a work that comes about. It's not yet written with ink. You guys are, are living epistles, uh, living letters for, for the Lord. So we don't really need to uh, commend ourselves because of what the work, uh, because of the work the Lord's done in you. Now, notice he, uh, he, the, he also goes on. He says the presence of the Holy Spirit is contrasted, again, with epistles written in ink as opposed to those are, that are living. And, and uh, he talks about how the Corinthians are, are on his heart. Now, he says the same thing to the church at Philippi, verse 7 of chapter 1, just as it is right for me to think this of all of you because I have you in my heart. Uh, Paul was a guy that went and wherever he went and ministered. Um, and, uh, and certainly here's the, uh, the application. If you're going to be serving anybody, whether it's uh, the Sunday school kids or people at work or the ministry God gives you in your own family. Your, the heart thing is very important. And, uh, and God uh, is uh, ministering through Paul because those people were upon his heart. And he says, you know, I don't really need any letters of commendation to present to you. Uh, you guys are my, my letters. The, again, bottom line for us in terms of the application to verse 18 where we want to go is that I think we all want that. We all want to be living epistles, not just the T-shirt. We actually want people to see Jesus in us. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit begins a work to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And, and frankly, 
Sometimes when we come to the Lord, many sins do not survive the impact of salvation. I mean, just getting saved, there's just, it's like sometimes you walk away and there's a lot of stuff that just drops away uh, right, right then. Uh, other times it's, uh, it's uh, issues and it's a struggle and we're crying out to the Lord and he's bringing changes uh, in, in our lives. But do those changes continue? Is that transformation still ongoing? Does it level off at some point in time? Again, the, the title of the message is, are we being transformed? Maybe we were to a degree as a young Christian, but are we still being transformed? Uh, because certainly that's, that's the will of God should be our desire to be a living epistle. He's going to tell us how to do that again in verse 18. Let's go on to uh, verses 4 to 6. The work of the Holy Spirit is what makes us productive for the ministry. Uh, and we have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So Paul says, Paul of all people, that we're not productive or sufficient uh, in and of ourselves. Now keep in mind that Paul was a brilliant guy, uh, had probably the, the best education you could get uh, in his day. He went to Punahou, then went on to Harvard, then went on to Harvard grad, grad school, got a PhD from Oxford. That is the equivalent of the Apostle Paul. He's written several best-selling books in academia. He's res respected by everyone uh, in, in, uh, in that, that intellectual world and that Greek culture. That would be the equivalent. He has one of the highest positions within Jerusalem, and, uh, and I would agree with those that believe that he was on the Sanhedrin him, uh, himself. Uh, so he is a brilliant guy, uh, and uh, as a Pharisee, he would have, if not all, most of the Old Testament memorized, uh, a brilliant guy. Now he's out to be a minister for Jesus Christ and to serve others, and he says, man, I just can't really do this. Who is sufficient for such things? Uh, and I think the point is that, that none of us are, and that's a, that's a good realization to, to come to. Uh, to do anything for the Lord. If you think you're sufficient, it will prevent the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you think you're sufficient, you will not be a living epistle known and read by all men because what we want them to see is an internal work of the Holy Spirit that makes us more like Jesus. And in and of ourselves, Paul says, nada, it's just not going to happen. And, uh, and, of course, he, he spends a lot of time developing this idea in the epistle to the church of Galatia that this idea of, of uh, ritualism, traditionalism, keeping a law, rules and regulations, personal discipline, uh, and all these things uh, are basically mutual exclusive to the work of the Spirit uh, in our lives. And, uh, and so we need to confess our own inadequacy and confess our dependence upon the Lord so that when he works, then he'll receive the glory. Now look again at verse 4. He says, and we have such trust uh, through Christ toward God. Now the word toward uh, is a Greek preposition, pros, and it means facing. So who are we really facing towards when it comes to, to serving others? We should be facing towards, towards God. Uh, that's, that's what we're to be looking at and facing towards. As the old hymn says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The face towards God. Uh, it's all about him. We are not sufficient. If we're ever going to be a, a living an epistle, if we're ever going to really fully comprehend our own insufficiency, we've got to do what it says in verse 18. And that's where we're trying to get to. Let's look at the third thing in this third little section. The work of the Spirit and the believer is glorious because it's permanent, verses 7 to 11. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, 
the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So the first thing we note here, and we'll begin to slow our pace down a bit, is that there was no permanence to the previous covenant, though Paul, he admits it was, it was glorious. The first covenant under Moses, it was pretty glorious, you know, being delivered out of, out of Egypt, all of the miracles that happened. Uh, they end up there in the Sinai. Moses goes up on the mountain. Uh, he comes down with the Ten Commandments, and, and um, his face is aglow from being in the presence of, of God. Uh, it was all very glorious, uh, that the tabernacle, the fact that they could have a, a relationship with God, and uh, God had revealed himself specifically you know, through, his, through his word and so forth. It was, a, it was a glorious thing, but it was something that was passing away. Now, later in verse 13, he'll make reference to the fact that Moses you know, put a, a veil over his face when he was not in front of the people because the glory was passing away, because it was really a symbol of that covenant. We've received the Mosaic law, the five books of Moses, how we can have a relationship with, uh, with God. Uh, it's, it's here and, and it's like my face. It's, fa it's just passing. It's all very temporary. Uh, and Moses was trying to, to hide that fact. Uh, he says that it's a covenant that brought condemnation compared to a covenant of righteousness, the one that Jesus brought about the night before he died when we take communion and we break the matzah, the bread, and the cup, those are the signs of the new covenant promised by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 when our relationship with Jesus would be completely different, one predicated upon what he's done for us uh, in his grace, two very different things. Now, he even calls Paul, the former rabbi Paul, the former Pharisee, uh, says that the first covenant actually was a covenant of death. It was glorious, but it was a covenant of death. Out of curiosity, I went to my little PC study Bible, hit my concordance. I typed in death, hit search, and it's there several hundred times. And if you do this, you will die. The soul that sins die. Touch this mountain, you will die. I mean, it's just like, okay, I got that. You know, 15 of those, I get the point. Paul's right. It was really a covenant of death. It was glorious, but he says it's nothing compared to what you and I have come to know in terms of a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, in terms of uh, his grace. Now, again, in his letter to the church at Galatia, Paul pointed out the deficiency of, of the law, uh, that the law could not justify the lost sinner, chapter 2, verse 16, could not give a sinner righteousness, chapter 2, verse 21, could not give the Holy Spirit, chapter 3, verse 2, could not give an inheritance, chapter 3, verse 18. Could not give life, verse 21 of chapter 3. And could not give freedom, chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. The law was there for a purpose, Paul says, to be our schoolmaster, to drive us to Christ. It was the mirror from which we look into and we saw condemnation. This is very important because that plays in verse 18. Uh, there's going to be a mirror that we look in there as well that brings us glory and not condemnation. That's only possible because of what Jesus has done uh, in the new covenant. Man's greatest need is righteousness. God's greatest gift is righteousness through Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul says in Galatians 2.21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in, in vain. Secondly, about the permanence, he says the permanence of the new covenant uh, is what makes it glorious. Verse 11, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Now, Paul's writing in an interesting time when you think about it because it's an overlap of history. It's not like, it's not like uh, uh, Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and the temple burned down. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like boom, boom. There's an overlap. Jesus dies. He rises from the, get, uh, from the dead. He uh, institutes the new covenant. And yet the temple is still there. The, the old covenant, in a sense, is still, still in, in operation. Uh, it was really an issue if, if you're Jewish and you've accepted Jesus. In fact, uh, I believe it's Paul that writes the letter to the, uh, to the Hebrews, who are a group of, uh, of, of Jewish believers, we'd say Messianic believers, living there in Judah. 
And there's a tremendous temptation for them to avoid persecution by going back under that old covenant, going back and practicing those things in the temple uh, once again. And uh, Paul tells them basically, no, you can't get unsaved <laughs> and then later get resaved. Once you're saved, you're saved. Uh, you're just going to have to look to the Lord and, and, uh, and deal with whatever comes your way in terms of uh, persecution. But it's an overlap in terms of, of history. And of course, 70 AD, the temple is destroyed by the Romans. That would mark the end of the Jewish religious system. But uh, here, uh, again, he's trying to compare two things in terms of the old covenant and uh, in the, in the new covenant, in terms of what that means to, to you and I. Probably not a None of you are probably real tempted to, where is that lamb? I'm thinking about doing that sacrifice thing this morning. Probably none of, nobody had that temptation out there, probably this morning. But what, so what does it mean to us? Uh, again, what he's trying to stress is one was temporary, it was passing, and one is, one is permanent. The new covenant, the grace of God, salvation in Jesus Christ, your place in heaven, it's not passing away, it's permanent. Uh, that's, that's the idea. Uh, if we're going to be changed by the Holy Spirit, we pretty much need, need to know that. I mean, if we spend most of our Christian experience, and some Christians do, questioning their own salvation, it leaves little room for the work of the Holy Spirit and the freedom that Christ wants to bring to us, let alone the fact that you probably are not going to be sharing a faith you're not sure you even have yourself if, if you... Uh, if you live that kind of uh, existence. And I, I kind of grew up in that, uh, uh, that culture, uh, sometimes referred to as yo-yo Christianity. You're up one day, you're down one day. <laughs> Both of my Pentecostal grandmothers would always write me letters or cards signed at the end, uh, stay prayed up because Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> and, uh, and that was, uh, you know, good. But the, what was meant was is that uh, because if you weren't prayed up and you weren't really walking as you should right then with the Lord, you'd miss the rapture because you could lose your salvation. It was a big, a, a big issue. And Paul says, this covenant is not passing. It's permanent. Jesus says in John 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. If that's all we have, that'd be good enough for me from the words of Jesus. But we could, we could go through a litany of scriptures. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus makes it pretty clear that the new covenant, the covenant of grace, under which we have come into a relationship with God and have salvation uh, is, is permanent. That is the glory of the new covenant, of glory of grace. God permanently gives us his Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Now, we sing the song from Psalm 51 once in a while incorrectly, where David says, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me, because it was an issue under the old covenant. The Holy Spirit was given to uh, prophets, priests, and kings for particular things that they were going to do on God's behalf, and then the Holy Spirit was, was taken back away. <laughs> we take a lot for granted, don't we? Uh, we don't have to, it's okay, I think the Lord understands if you happen to sing it because you're singing scripture, but it's not an issue for us. God is not going to take the Holy Spirit away, and he wants his spirit to work in us to make us living epistles, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. How does that happen? That's in verse 18. Well, let's go on to verse 12. The work of the Holy Spirit is in the believer, uh, and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer involves a process. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, 
and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So here the process of transformation. How does it work? Well, first he says, it's related to speech. Verse 12, we use great boldness of speech. We're not always really bold for the Lord, are we? Even the Apostle Paul uh, talked about his own fear, his own weakness at, at time. Uh, prayed. He asked others to pray that he would have boldness. That's, that's encouraging to me because <laughs> I just picture he's this type A guy. He's going out there going for it no, no matter what kind of a thing. And I, I you know, by all accounts, he, he was, but, you know, and he, and he still felt like, man, I need somebody to pray that I would have boldness. Uh, and, and he says it's based on, on hope. And, uh, and I think that when the Holy Spirit is working in you, in conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ, and you see what the Lord is doing in your life, you kind of want to tell other people. I think it's just a, a natural, he says, you know, this work of the Holy Spirit, we've got boldness, and it's based on hope, uh, because there's something going on in terms of his ministry and serving others, but I think internally, uh, in terms of his own life. And, uh, and I know that... Um, uh, again, as a, as a young Christian, when uh, the, the more obvious things, <laughs> the, the words that we choose to use, and uh, uh, things like drug addictions and things like that, when those things are dropping away, that's pretty exciting stuff. And uh, it's like, praise, praise God, you know, where my life was headed, but where it's headed now, and it was to it's totally a work of the, of the Holy Spirit. You, it's just a lot easier. I mean, to just tell people about that, to say, man, there's, there's hope for you. Look what the Lord did, did for me. That's what Paul is saying here. But again, as we move along in our Christian experience, we can begin to rely upon past experiences, and that'll really keep us from being bold for the Lord. We can begin to rely upon, because there's big warnings here, right, about not falling under the law. And Jesus said it's even more than that. He, he was, uh, uh, again, rebuking the, the Pharisees because not just the law, but they were hung up on the traditions of men beyond the law. And we can all make our own little traditions of men and what, and what we do and how things work in my own experience with the Lord. And these things can really prevent the transformational work of the Holy Spirit in giving us a, a boldness in speech. Secondly, the process of transformation is rela related to sight, verse 14. But, in their, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. So here he's talking about the fact that he's kind of crossing metaphors, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. I'm going to go back to Exodus and read this whole scene with, uh, with Moses and the veil, because it's very interesting, obviously very, very, uh, very pertinent. But uh, he's talked about Moses and the veil that he would place over himself. But he says, in the same way, there's a spiritual blindness over people. It's like a veil, and it keeps them from getting it in terms of God's word. You know, there's a lot of, uh, if you think about the people that are very religious, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's a Christian denomination or whether it's Jewish people around the, word, around the world that uh, sit in a synagogue and hear the word read every week and don't get it in terms of the grace of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he died for their sins, and Paul, who's, who has such a heart for his own people, but he's the apostle to the Gentiles, and he's seen them get saved in the droves, and he's saying, what's going on here? He says, it's like a blindness in a veil that, that's over their eyes. And he says that it's Jesus Christ that removes that, that veil. In fact, he goes on in chapter 4 to talk about the God of this age who's blinded people and prevents them from seeing the glory of, of the gospel. So it's possible uh, again, it's possible even as, as believers to reach a point where we're just, we're kind of just blinded to, to the word. And if we are, there is no transformational work of the Holy Spirit. We get, if we reach that stage, if we get caught up into kind of a legalism, again, that's a lot of references to the Old Covenant versus New Covenant, the law versus grace, one kills, one gives life, one gives righteousness, one brings condemnation, 
If we get caught up into that in our Christian experience, uh, it will prevent this transformation of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul also writing, excuse me, not writing, but uh, reference to him in Acts 28, uh, last chapter of the book, uh, quotes Isaiah, one of the passages we went through a few weeks ago in the midweek study, uh, and he talks about this idea of, of spiritual blindness. In Acts 28, 25, uh, it says there, So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word, quote, The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. Verse 27, what was the problem? For their hearts, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I would heal them. Now, Isaiah prophesies this initially over the Jewish people about about 65 years before they're overrun by the Assyrians there in the northern kingdom. And he's warning them about their spiritual blindness. Paul looks back at Isaiah and kind of pulls it out and says, the same thing is happening today. The same thing is happening today. It's still possible for people to be blinded to things spiritually so that when the Bible is read, when the scripture is read, it has little or no effect. When you read the scriptures, it could have little or, or no effect. Uh, is the application. Thirdly, he says the process of transformation is related to the veil, and this is where we get to verse 18. Let me read that again, and then we'll, we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about Moses uh, and the veil, because that's the illustration for transformation. Verse 18, and, uh, and again, let me just uh, make reference to the NIV, and I, I said that uh, I, I'd, uh, uh, that verse has really meant a lot to me, because when I first got saved, I wanted more than fire insurance. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I knew that, you know, I just got kind of fed up with my life, very desperate, <clears throat> and um, not to uh, bore you with the, uh, the details of that, but uh, in desperation, got down on my knees and, and cried out to the Lord that he would forgive me and save me, but I was praying for more than fire insurance. I was praying for more of that, and then someday I would go to heaven. I was really praying that he would change me. Uh, he would change who I was. He would change the direction of my life. Uh, that's really a lot of what I was uh, praying for uh, at, at the time. Uh, and I saw him, took me at my word. I saw him doing that work in my life and making some pretty radical changes. And I was uh, thrilled, of course, and very thankful. Uh, and then uh, at some point in time began in my workshop listening to uh, Pastor Chuck over the radio and, and tapes. And I remember Chuck going through this, this verse. Uh, and... Um, and I remember taking, a, which uh, kind of was my habit to do, I took one of my uh, black felt pen markers and I would write Bible verses on, on my workbench. And uh, so, uh, so I could look them up later. I'd write the references down and stuff. And, uh, and I, re I remember reading this verse over and over again because that's what I had prayed for. That's what the, the Lord had done. And uh, that's what I wanted the Lord to, to keep doing. But here was my understanding is that uh, we with all unveil unveiled faces, you know, we're saved. We don't have a veil, you know, like those that don't understand the word. Uh, you know, we're being transformed. Uh, it's by work of the Holy Spirit with ever increasing. So, the, so as we walk through our Christian experience, the Holy Spirit is changing us to be more like, more like Jesus Christ. It's just, it's just job. <laughs> Pretty sure he's got to do it. Uh, and actually, this verse says something very different than that. So we want to dissect that here in a moment. But to really do that, let's look at the illustration. Exodus 34, verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him, when he's talking with God. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Probably thought he was in a nuclear accident. No. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. 
I'm sorry, it's just funny. Moses comes down, it's like, okay, I've got the Ten Commandments, and everybody's running away. Hey, come on, get back over here, you know? It's like, it's kind of, kind of comical. God's got a sense of humor. Uh, verse 32, afterwards, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And I've got this in bold for you, verse 33. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Now, I've seen a lot of Christian artwork, and uh, I remember restoring uh, a beautiful window down at St. Andrew's Cathedral that depicts uh, what we just read. And it's, the, uh, it's an image of, uh, of Moses, and he's got the veil over him, and he's got the, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, uh, and, and he's got the, he's got the, he's kind of radiating, you know, got the, uh, that going on and everything. And then there's all the people, as though his face were covered when he was speaking to the people. And, and uh, as you said, we just saw there, that, that was not the case at all. Moses didn't put the veil over his face until he was, until he was done. Moses went before the Lord. He was in the presence of God, and God's glory shone upon him. And then he went to the people, and they were so freaked out, they ran away, and he had to call them back. And he spoke to them. And when he was done, he was being a living epistle, known and read by all men. And when he was done and he walked away, he put the veil on because he was fading, not, one them, not wanting them to know that it would fade, that it was not permanent. It wasn't a permanent, this covenant. It was a passing covenant. And let's go on in, in that chapter down to verse 34. But whenever Moses went be, in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So here's the, uh, the illustration that Paul is trying to help us understand in terms of the transformational work of, of the Holy Spirit. The illustration is... Moses goes in to glory, and the glory shines upon him in terms of the presence of God. Then he goes down, and he appears before all the people as a living epistle, known and read by all men. And what they see is the glory of God upon him. And then he's done. He puts the veil on. He goes back, meet with God, takes the veil off. God's glory is on upon him again. He goes back, and now he speaks to the people, and they see the presence of God upon him again. He's done? Okay, he puts the veil back on. He's going from glory to glory. And that's the, uh, the illustration for, uh, for us here. Uh, again, it's something that happens to him and to us internally, not externally. And let's look at verses 18 again. I'm going to kind of slice and dice this and try to open it up for us. It's really uh, very interesting. Verse 18 Again, notice that it's, but we all. So when Paul says the Holy Spirit wants to transform you to be like Jesus Christ, and it's a process that you go through, it's not for the elite Christians. It's not only for those that are evangelists. It's not just for the missionaries. It's just, it's everybody. Is that pretty clear? But we all. Uh, and then he says, with unveiled face. Now, the unveiled face is not a direct reference to Moses. It's to those that could not understand the word because Jesus had not removed that veil yet from them. Jesus has removed the veil from us. We're born again. We've come into a relationship. We're under the covenant of grace. We're under the new covenant, not the old covenant, the permanent covenant. And so all of us who have been born again by God's spirit, uh, and again, that's... Uh, a little technical, but just that it's perfect tense. It means it happened in the past and there's going to be continued results. Uh, we don't get born again, again, and again. We just, we just are. All of us, Jesus has removed the veil from us. Third, we go on and it says uh, the word beholding. But we all with unveiled face, all believers, all believers are beholding or to be beholding. Now, this is interesting because it's in a Greek middle voice, which means that it is something you do, not something done to you. See, I was always under the impression that the work of the Holy Spirit transforming us was just something the Holy Spirit did. 
I just kind of had to get up in the morning and breathe, you know, and it would just, you know, kind of just kind of happen because, you know, it's he's the Holy Spirit. It's his job, his job description. It's supposed to change me to be like Jesus. And I realized there was probably some things I could kind of help out with a little bit, but pretty much it's just going to happen, you know, because that's God's will. If you, you read Ephesians and uh, one of the purposes that he that he saved us. But this is something very different. Paul says uh, we all who are believers Veil's gone. Jesus has removed the veil. It is up to us whether or not we must choose to behold the glory of God. And if we choose to behold the glory of God, then he will change us from one state of glory to another state of glory. That's the idea. And Moses is, is the illustration. So what must we behold? Well, again, it's the, like Moses. It's the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Well, it's his it's his attributes, it's his character, it's his grace, it's his mercy. Now, David tells us in the Psalms that the heavens declare the glory of God, and you could stand out on a starry night, which is an awesome thing to do, and observe the glory of God in creation. But that view will always be very limited because creation will never tell you anything about redemption. It will never tell you about Jesus Christ dying for your sin, that you can have a personal relationship about his grace, about heaven, about his purpose for your life. Heavens declare the glory of God. So that's, I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about how do we behold. I don't think it's standing out at night looking at the stars. What is it that God has given us where he tells us about his glory? It's his word. And again, James makes that reference in his epistle as, as well. So how does this all work? It works this way. I have to choose every day whether I'm going to go to God's word and I'm going to behold his glory in that word and experience his presence. The Holy Spirit will not do it. He will not make me. I have to choose to do it. Somebody else can't do it for me. But if I do that like Moses... Now, when I'm around other people, my skin's going to shine. Actually, I'll be a living epistle. They'll be able to see Jesus in me. A transformation, it's not just an automatic deal with ever-increasing glory. It's from, it's from doxon. It's from glory to this glory. It's like Moses with God and then before the people. I have to choose to do it, and no, nobody can do it for me. Really shouldn't surprise us, should it? I mean, the, the, this idea. But uh, again, the work is internal. The word for transformed is uh, metamorphosis, which is really just taking the Greek word and saying it uh, in English in the most common way to understand that is the metamorphosis of a caterpillar that makes this cocoon and then comes out the other side, the butterfly. It's still, it's still the caterpillar. Uh, there was no switch in the, in the middle of the night, but there's an internal transformation that is then seen externally. Uh, and that's, that's the idea. God the Holy Spirit wants to internally change us so that everyone, all believers, are more like Jesus Christ so that we can be bold of speech, so that we can be living epistles known and read by all men. And what's required of us is that we, every day, very often, we get to the word of God and behold the the glory of God. And again, there's, there's two warnings built into this. One is that if you make this your tradition, if you make it legalistic, read my three chapters today, how about you? It's, it's not, that's not what we're talking about here. Is that, is, that, is that pretty clear? It's pretty much just reading the, reading the Bible and allowing God to speak to you. And then you see, you see God's glory. You see Jesus touch a leper and heal him. You see his compassion on crowds. And you look and you see the glory of God in it every day. So I don't think I can find it. Keep reading. It's, it's there. And uh, boy, it's been one of the, our study in Isaiah has just been awesome. The, 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 the compassion of God and the grace of God through the Isaiah, the prophets, just been, uh, been amazing. There's, it's, it's there. And if we, with unveiled faces, will behold that and choose to do that, then Paul says that God will change us and transform us. So 
legalism is, is an issue, and I think he's brought that out. And uh, it's not an automatic deal. We need to constantly remind ourselves we're under the covenant of grace. But the other issue we mentioned, spiritual blindness, <clears throat> which is a condition of the heart. It was a problem with, <clears throat> with the Jews in Paul's day, continues to be uh, in our day. But the same is true for, for each of us. Listen to the uh, warning of the writer of Hebrews. Again, I think it's the Apostle Paul. There's five warnings there, and this is one of them in chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Our message last week. Sin is an issue, isn't it? Does that make sense? That if we're not really right with the Lord, that we're not, we're not going to really behold and be trans, transformed. <laughs> and there's a deceitfulness, a trickery to sin that actually would cause our hearts to be hardened. So it's, it's not an automatic deal. You know, it's not going to be, okay, if I read three chapters every day this week, seven days this week, you know, then I'm going to be more like Jesus next week. You know, you might. If your heart is right before the Lord and you're looking to him and his grace and Every day you're looking to see the glory of God uh, in, in that text, and it's there. I, I think you will. I think you will. But again, it's a process, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit, and it's for uh, everyone. What are, in closing, read a little quote from Alan Redpath uh, in his book, Blessings Out of uh, Buffeting. And he's uh, remarking on the relationship the Apostle Paul had uh, with the Lord, uh, the kind of relationship that uh, is being discussed here. Of Paul, Allen wrote, he would say, <clears throat> I've had a clear view of Jesus. I've seen him, felt him, and known him in a far deeper way than simply by the outward physical appearance. I felt the reality of his life begin to burn in my heart. I've seen in Christ the glory of a life that is totally submitted to the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> that glory began to take hold of me. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've begun to see that this is the one life God expects of any man he has made in his own image. I've seen the marks of the cross upon him, and by his grace the marks of the cross have been put upon me, and I'm, I'm no longer my own. I'm bought with a price, redeemed by his precious blood. Yes, I've seen him in the inward sense of a deep spiritual reality. I have had a clear view of Jesus, and my life will never be the same again. And then Alan goes on to stress the fact that that's normal Christianity. That is what Paul is saying is for, but we all. This is, this is what God wants to do. That's his will for us, to change us. And that's how it happens. And that's how it happens. Uh, it's not just get up, getting up and kind of breathing every day. <coughs> and <coughs> I've actually got to be the participant <coughs> in opening the word to myself <clears throat> so that I can see God's glory in it, and then he'll make me a living epistle. Give me a, a boldness of speech, and other people will see Jesus Christ in me. Think you'd be a better husband then? Think you'd be a better wife, better mom, better dad, better employee? Think more people would come to faith in Jesus Christ? I think so. <clears throat> but I have to tell you, this, it, this is all about it, submission and surrender, isn't it? We're, we're trying to see him and then have him work in us to change, change us. Yeah, but it's a work that he wants to do. So are we being transformed? That's our question. Father, we... Uh
Every voice united in an orchestration. So, so 